Good morning. It's lovely to be here with you all this morning. I'll go ahead and get us started with a word of prayer. Merciful and heavenly Father of all creation, thank you for your word and the Holy Spirit as they guide us in our understanding of ourselves as image bearers of you. As we experience the influences of the world on how we think about ourselves, help us to keep our orientation on you so that in a world of strangeness, we can feel our feet on your firm foundation. Help us to hear your words of hope and reassurance that you are sovereign over all things as we explore the ways the world has departed from your truth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, strangeness is in reference to our new series um, based off the book Strange New World, How Thinkers and Activists Redefined Identity and Sparked the Sexual Revolution uh, by Carl Truman. Some of you um, may have been here when Truman came and spoke at our Scattered Seeds Symposium after the publication of his book Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. (laughs) And uh, that was a more academic book. And so after that book came out, he wrote this one, which is in some ways a companion piece, not a a perfect match, but is written for more the lay person, um, you and I, as opposed to other academics. And so um, he then came out with a video series for this. And we're going to spend the next six weeks going through some of those videos. Um, My purpose in talking to you this morning is going to be to introduce the series to you, and also to talk about the beginnings of um, this kind of movement and change in thinking that he points uh, or places within the the movement of romanticism. So that's, I'm going to be talking for about 10 minutes, and then I'm going to pass it to Dr. Bennett, who's going to be specifically talking about Rousseau and Rousseau's um, shifts in thinking that contributed to our strange new world. Um, So the first thing that I'm going to do is draw your attention to one of the handouts that I gave you. It's titled Strange New World Key Terms. If you don't have that, there's one on the chair to my left, your right, and there's also um, one over on the table where Dr. Bennett is standing. I've also included two poems that I'm going to reference later um, as examples of some of the ideas we'll be talking about in terms of romanticism. So the first definition uh, that I want to talk about is self. In his title, Truman claims that identity has been redefined, which resulted in the sexual revolution and the shifts in attitudes and beliefs about some of the most basic aspects of human existence, sex, marriage, gender. He begins by defining the term self as where the real me is found. This contrasts with the belief that the self is the basic consciousness of ourselves as individual people. I found the series of questions he asks helpful in discerning the two ways of conceiving the self, and I've included these questions in your handout. Uh, The title traditional self is my title, not his, but I thought it just kind of countered the the title modern self, which is one that he uses very frequently. So on the left side, um, you'll see three questions. Am I to be understood primarily in terms of my obligations toward and dependence upon others? For example, I am Rebecca Sparks. I am the daughter of Jim and Judy Thompson, the wife of Stephen, the mother of JP. That's how I would automatically describe myself to most people. Um, but that's in contrast to a modern self center. Um, ideation of the self, am I born free and able to create my own identity? Then does education consist in training me in the demands and expectations of the wider culture and forming me, shaping me into that which will serve the community at large? And we can think about this Christianly in light of last week's sermon on Christian formation and sanctification. How are we being formed and how is our education forming us? It's a very traditional view, which contrasts to how many people think of themselves in the modern era. Does education consist in enabling me to then express outwardly that which I feel inwardly. And the last question, is growing up a process by which I learn to control my feelings, to act with restraint and sacrifice my desires to those of the community around me? Or, for the modern self, is growing up a process not of learning restraint, but rather of capitalizing on opportunities to perform? So am I here to contribute 
and be working within the communal system? Or am I here so that you know who I am, so that I can present myself to you? It's kind of the difference in the idea. And here's a quote from Truman that kind of summarizes this idea of modern self. The modern self assumes the authority of inner feelings and sees authenticity as defined by the ability to give social expression to the same. The modern self also assumes that society at large will recognize and affirm this behavior. Such a self is defined by what is called expressive individualism. So you'll see that I have four more definitions for you there at the bottom of the page. Those are directly from Truman's um, glossary, but I'm going to give a little commentary to all of them as well. Expressive individualism, individualism is the next term, and it was con coined by Robert Bela in around 1996, so relatively recently. Bela states that expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be recognized. The assumption then is that if one fails to express this core of feeling and intuition, one fails to realize his or her individual identity and is being inauthentic. Charles Taylor calls this demand that one should express one's individuality, individuality as the culture of authenticity. Truman explains that the modern self is one where authenticity is only achieved by acting outwardly in accordance with one's inward feelings. So truth is inside. We should trust our feelings always. The next term is sexual revolution, which is the liberalization of attitudes towards sex and sexuality that began in the West um, in the 1960s. And I'm not going to expand on that because I'm assuming a level of familiarity with that term. Um, but on page 25... Um, he goes into, Truman goes into a little bit uh, more about um, what kind of shifts in the sexual revolution has occurred since the 1960s. The sexual revolution does not simply represent a growth in the routine transgression of traditional sexual codes or even a modest expansion of the boundaries of what is and is not acceptable sexual behavior. Not at all. Rather, it is the repudiation of the very idea of such codes in their entirety. More than that, it has come in certain areas, such as that of homosexuality and transgenderism, to require the positive repudiation of traditional sexual mores to the point where belief in or maintenance of such views has come to be seen as ridiculous and even a sign of serious mental or moral deficiency. If the individual's inner identity is defined by sexual desire, then he or she must be allowed to act out on that desire in order to be an authentic person. Uh, next, our last term is social imaginary. It's also from Charles Taylor, who commented on authenticity before. He says that he speaks of imaginary first because he's talking about the way ordinary people imagine their social surroundings. And this is often not expressed in theoretical terms. The average person isn't, isn't thinking theoretically about this. It's just they're living their lives in a normal way, um, but they're carrying with them these ideas that they've picked up from the broader culture. And this, these ideas are carried in images, stories, legends, etc. But it's also the case that second, theory is often the possession of a small minority. Whereas what is interesting in the social imaginary is that it is shared by large groups of people, if not the whole society. Which leads to a third difference. The social imaginary is that common understanding which makes possible common practices and a widely shared sense of legitimacy. So if what we know is then practiced by a large group of people, that simply knowing it and then practicing it makes it a legitimate claim and reasonable to do. Um, all right. With these terms in mind, I'm going to shift to talking about the Romantic era, which is where Truman starts to track the thinkers that he claims are helping us redefine identity. He begins the analysis of the shift in understanding the self and therefore redefining identity during the period of Romanticism. 
Romanticism is the movement in arts and literature in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, embracing the primary primacy of the individual and focusing on the force of nature and the natural world. Some familiar composers and writers from this time period, um, it's the later work of Beethoven. Beethoven kind of um, helped bridge uh, neoclassical with the romantic, but Liszt, Chopin, Wagner, Verdi, Tchaikovsky, those are probably words that, uh, names that are familiar to you. Um, but the writers would be uh, Williams Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, uh, Shelley, Keats, Jane Austen, the Bronte sisters, uh, William Blake, Lord Byron, Walt Whitman, and Poe here in the United States. So some very familiar names, hopefully, to you. So the Enlightenment and Neoclassicism preceded this era, uh, era of Romanticism. And Romanticism was... Um, really a reaction to the preeminence of the human reason in the discourse of Enlightenment thinkers and the emphasis on order, rationalism, idealization in the arts. So the Romantics redefined the role of the poet and what the poet should be giving to the people and explored new forms and new content in their poetry and writing and art and music that had before this time not been explored. And they also privileged emotions and the imagination in their work as of over reason and order and logical um, expression. And so as a result of this shift, the romantics are credited by Truman for helping grant the decisive authority to the inner feelings of people that was necessary for all of the other shifts in thinking to occur. So for the romantics, the relationship between the work and themselves was far more important than the relationship between the work that they were making and their audience. In literary criticism, this is referred to as having an expressive epistemology. So we hear this term expressive here in the Romantic era, way before expressive individualism became a term that, term that we were using. So epistemology is the theory of knowledge with regard to its methods. So how do we know something? Its validity. How do we know that that is true? And also the scope and breadth of the knowledge that we can have. The Romantics saw the poet or the artist as the source and touchstone of art not the subject matter and not the work or the work or its reader the poet and his perceptions are at the center therefore poetry is now a form of self expression in a way it had never been before and it's a representation of the unique perceptions of each individual Nature is often a topic that is uh, in romantic works, and the romantics are known for their nature poetry. Um, but many poets throughout time have talked about nature, but the romantics did it in a new and different way. It wasn't so much that their poetry was about nature and that its topic was nature. Instead, the poetry about nature was the poet's personal thoughts and personal feelings as he or she is experiencing and living in nature. So the, the object of the work is not nature. The object of the work is the thoughts and feelings of the person writing about the nature. Me. 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 Yep. So in the preface of Lyrical Ballads, Wordsworth says, poetry is a spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings or an externalization of the internal emotions moods, and perceptions of the poet. The feelings around an action are more important than the action itself. So this is very different from an Aristotelian idea of what uh, good writing and works and drama and poetry should be, which centered on plot. Now we're really focused on character and perception in the works. I've included two poems by William Blake in your handout for you. These poems are part of a larger collection that he did that juxtaposes two poems written about the same topic, but from two different perspectives. So this collection of work that he did are called The Songs of Innocence and The Songs of Experience. And William Blake was one of the earliest romantic writers and really focused on this idea of perception. So the innocent poem, if you look at the last two lines, ends on this idea of hope. But these two poems are about chimney sweeps, which were uh, either orphaned children, uh, five years of age, perhaps even younger, or 
uh, children who were sold by their families to be chimney sweeps. They died at very young ages. They, they literally climbed up chimneys to clean them. They would get stuck. They'd suffocate. They'd get lung cancer from all of the soot and exposure. It was, it was not a pleasant life. Um, so the ong, Song of Innocence ends on this kind of hopeful note. And then the Song of Experience on the other side um, really hits on the... Um, the uh, negative, per- you, don't, you don't have that hopeful end because um, experience um, makes you a little more cynical. <laughs> so uh, this is an idea of kind of the writing that was being presented in the Romantic period. And William Blake's work highly influenced Wordsworth and Coleridge and their work in lyrical ballads because it's all about your perception of something. And I see many of you taking a minute to look at the poetry, so I'll be quiet for you. Sorry to go back. No, can you give uh, an example of social imaginary? Oh, sure. Okay. So, let's see. Um, I guess a, a good one would be the discourse around abortion. And a lot of times the language that we're using um, dictates how we think about something. And so if you're not calling a fetus a person, which that is literally the etymology of the word, but um, if you're not referring to an unborn child as a human, if you're choosing other language and you're solely referring to it in that language and the media is picking up that language and then it becomes the discourse in uh, the discussion of the youth, then that's how it is imagined for the society moving forward. Does that help? All right. All right. So I'm not going to dive into the poems. I just wanted to give you an example of where the romantics were going. And for them, the truth of a thing is not in the thing itself. It is in the eye of the beholder of that thing. And so his or her perception is how, the tr- uh, how something truly is. So not only that, but our perceptions of a thing can also help create the world around us, hence the abortion example that I was just just giving. Like how we think about that and perceive that, we can then speak to that and it becomes then the social imaginary. So in this way, the mundane things, the common things in the world can be rendered supernatural and the supernatural mundane can become, uh, excuse me, and the supernatural can become then mundane. Um, So perception in this is central. Objects take their ultimate nature, not from what they are, but from what they are perceived by the poet. So Wordsworth and Coleridge do this in their groundbreaking work, Lyrical Ballads, which for many people, um, in addition to Blake, is the beginning of romanticism. It's, It's the production of this new shift in ideas, and it's considered the cornerstone of the romantic movement. So in this work, Wordsworth aims to move his reader out of what is co- he calls a savage uh, terper and back to an appreciation of truth and beauty. For him, poetry should enlarge and refine our sensibilities and rehumanize us. He saw being in touch with our feelings as being truly human. It should restore a childlike wonder and call us to a higher sensitivity. Through the expression of their inner thoughts and feelings, we, their readers, are expected to engage with our own and to begin to perceive the world in a new way. This is also why children are often a part of subject matter in romantic works, where before now they hadn't really been. And the child's imaginative naivete is celebrated. Two other terms from the Romantic era that help to grant authority to inner feelings are the willing suspension of disbelief and also something called negative capability. So the willing suspension of disbelief is from Coleridge, and he describes how the artist expects us as his reader to suspend our reason and logic to enter through the power of the sympathetic imagination into the life and heart of a work. So we see this kind of uh, leaving of enlightenment reason and diving into having an emotional and sympathetic response instead of following a logic, logical argument. While Wordsworth's goal in lyrical ballads was to awaken us from our savage torpor and see the beauty in the ordinary around us, 
Coleridge's was the opposite. He aimed to present the supernatural world in a way that rendered it almost natural. Um, If you're familiar with his poem, The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner, I highly recommend it. If I printed it for you, it'd be 15 pages long, so I didn't print it for you. But if you've ever um, heard reference to the albatross around your neck... That's from this poem, and it's, it's absolutely beautiful. Even if you just read a little bit of an excerpt from it, I highly recommend that you do. But uh, he, he takes the supernatural um, God with us and, um, and the choices that we make, and, and it's literally an albatross around the guy's neck <laughs> and weighing him down, and he has to release that. It's beautiful. But uh, this is accomplished through the revelation of dramatic and emotional truths. So we're moving behind describing something exactly as it is in our works in the Enlightenment era, and now we're looking for the psychological truth, the emotional truth in a work. Coleridge expected his readers to have an active shaping imagination that's able to synthesize, so put together kind of the meaning that he's trying to draw from us and that the the poet is actively trying to reveal through emotion. The other term is negative capability, and it's from John Keats. Um, he's not the beginner of, ne- of, of negative capability, but he kind of coined this term to describe what he saw in specific writers, um, including Shakespeare. So this is what uh, made Shakespeare so great. Negative capability is an artist's ability to enter the lives of other beings and to see the world from their perspective. So he characterized Milton and Wordsworth as having something kind of contrary to this, an egotistical sublime is what he calls it, which means that their work and visions of the world are mediated through their own strong, dominant personalities. So when you're reading a poem, you're getting a lot of the author himself, but you're also um, with the egotistical sublime. But if you're really into negative capability, you're able to remove yourself as the poet and, and touch those truths and emotions, even if they're not what you're experiencing yourself. To possess negative capability, one must be able to rest in the midst of mysteries and paradoxes without needing to reach any fixed answers or resolutions. And that contrasts with the willing suspension of disbelief because it's a quality of the poet, not a quality of the reader. And Keats calls for artists to not just have sympathy for the reader, but empathy. And either way, the imagination is key here. With these ideas, we begin to see how a social imaginary is being formed that favors an expressive nature. The inner world of one's thoughts and feelings are no longer kept to the individual. They are a vehicle through which larger truths are known. And we are encouraged to put ourselves in others' places, which is empathy, and see the world from their perspective, which is the negative capability piece. These, are, these other perspectives are now valid um, and objects for our consideration. So my inner feelings and the inner feelings of others now have an authority that's sufficient in influence to how then I begin to make decisions. So that's an intro, introduction to romanticism. <laughs> All right, I'm going to be super quick so that we can watch the video. You were supposed to stop me. That's okay. I was, I was in it. I was enjoying it. But I am going to use this um, to do something really quickly. Uh, Carl Truman's tapping into a shift that happens in the 17th and 18th century regarding uh, um, a view of human nature. All the way back from Plato, Aristotle... Um, uh, Augustine, Aquinas, and Descartes, which he lists Rene Descartes um, right before he lists Rousseau, is this notion of the human person in which we have reason at the top, we have passions, this is the understanding of the soul, and we have appetites. Uh, And From the beginning, this was the understanding of a human person, and that we are primarily created in God's image to be reasoners and have thoughts and ideas, and these are supposed to govern our passions, and our passions govern our desires. And so it's supposed to be ordered in this particular way. By the 17th century, you start to have a a different, there's... um, 
there's reasons in the scientific revolution that start to play out into this notion of the human person that it gets inverted. It gets flipped upside down. So now, like with Rousseau, we'll get into this, the appetites are really where the human person is, is, is where the human person is defined. Your particular desires and appetites is really what makes you, 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 not these abstract thoughts and ideas. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, um, and then we'll get to the video. Uh, so, I mean, the one thing that I would say about Rousseau that uh, might be helpful to remember is that people are the worst. Uh, for Jean-Jacques Rousseau, other people, um, well, to use another philosopher's um, quip that, that um, he read Rousseau is, is Jean-Paul Sartre who said, hell is other people. That's essentially true for Rousseau. Other people will ruin you. Society will ruin you. To your core, in your human nature, you are good. Uh, creation is good. But once men start touching things, it all goes to ruin. So you'll see at the top there, I've sort of systematized his thought in, in sort of a theological way. Uh, he does have a doctrine of creation. Everything's good, but as soon as human beings start touching things, all goes to hell, literally. In this original state of nature, th this is, um, sorry, I'm trying to like run through this, but there's so much, but you know, in political philosophy in the 17th and 18th century, they would envision this state of nature to talk about politics. What was it like before society? Rousseau talks about that. What was it like before human beings started getting together and relying and depending on each other? This is called the state of nature. Well, the state of nature was pristine and beautiful and perfect. And then people started getting together and relying on each other and saying, that's mine, this is my private property, and so on and so forth. And then enters the equation envy and vanity and dependence and stealing and all sorts of terrible things. But in the beginning... Everything was great and good, and God made everything great and good. Uh, but as soon as human beings start interacting with each other, all hell breaks loose. So you'll see under uh, his, his doctrine of sin, hamartiology is, is the doctrine of sin, our original sin was dependence. When we started depending on others, when we couldn't do things ourselves, when we no longer were Robinson Crusoe, that's when things started to fall apart. We started to depend on each other. And because we depended on each other, we started to compete with one another. And that led to division, and then envy, and then vanity. And Rousseau paints this picture in which we start to compare and contrast ourselves with others. And this alienates us. Others force us to question ourselves and our intuitions, and our feelings, and whatnot, and this causes an alienation within us. And so we start to buy into what others are doing, and who they are, and try to compare ourselves, and become like them. And Rousseau has a very trenchant critique of all the arts and the sciences, that it's this pursuit for envy and vanity, and that the more that we progress as a society, the more we actually regress. We're becoming worse and worse and worse because we're competing and uh, comparing ourselves to, to each other. So he calls society a vast desert. It's just, it's death, it's dry, it's, you know, it's everything that's wrong with all of us. Now the way, that, the way in which he proposes that we fix this is through the state. The state and all of its laws helps us become free uh, helps us learn what the good is. And so the state is the savior for Rousseau. And finally, th what heaven looks like, I know you all love him. You're going to go read him now. He's amazing. Uh, he's actually a very sophisticated thinker, actually. Uh, I'm not doing him justice at all. But um, you do get this notion that what's idyllic, the, the perfect the perfect consummate happiness would be for us to learn to go back in, to not 
be ruined by others, but to tap back into our appetites, our feelings, who we really are, and not let society ruin us. Not let envy and vanity ruin us, which causes us to, to be alienated. Other people's consciences start to affect our choices, and we don't, we don't know what we should do, and we're split apart. We're split down the middle. And so for, for Rousseau, the, the heaven would be that we come to find ourselves again as whole individuals who aren't bifurcated, who aren't duplicitous. Um, but that involves getting away from society. So you'll see there in the, uh, uh, the last section just some insights that I would say feed into expressive individualism. People are fake in vain. And we know this to be true in some cases. Um, and, and that's a problem because they're going to corrupt us. Other people are going to corrupt us. A regular and simple life is ideal. There is this notion in Rousseau, uh, like there is in Henry David, Th Henry David Thoreau, that if we were just alone on an island, we would be fine. You know? But a simple and regular life is, is ideal, but we're constantly, in society, we're constantly being lured and attracted to the next thing that we should want, which leads to envy and vanity. There is a notion in Rousseau all throughout it, which I've hinted at with, re with respect to appetites, that following your heart is really where it's at. Uh, don't think too much. Um, but all of your pursuits and who you really are and what you really want to become are embedded in, in, in your desires. And so following your heart is uh, something that you need to do in the cacophony of wisdom and voices that are telling you what you need and what you need to do. Finally, you were made to be free. And that true freedom is when you are able to listen to your own voice and to your own feelings and desires, and not be swayed by society and others. Questions, comments, concerns, fears, frustrations, deep sighs? So he was a Green Day fan who was poor at science. Is that what <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I could, yeah. How much of this do you agree with? <laughs> oh, I mean, I think, I think Rousseau makes some incredible points about society that they're not novel. I mean, they're, in, they're also in uh, you know, Western, other Western thinkers. I don't think we take seriously, perhaps, I mean, it, it, on the cusp of the scientific revolution, he's identifying the desire for us to investigate in the arts and the sciences is because we're envious and we're vain. And I think there's something true about that. But I mean, like the follow your heart and the... You know. Yeah, I mean, you're asking my opinion, right? I, I think what you, have in Western, what you have in Western thought is two ways of viewing human nature and the human person. And uh, w one, one group just keeps it the way it was all throughout Western Civ, and the other one just inverts it. I think that's wrong. I think Rousseau and others in the Romantics, they are tapping into your emotions tell you a lot about yourself. And I would agree with that. Our, our emotions are built up based on our environments and situations and experiences. So there is something true yeah, about that. Our emotions rule. Right, yes. But, you know, for somebody like Plato, passions are bad. Whereas, you know, anger will tell you a lot about how you think the world ought to be. And that's insightful, right? So I don't think it's just going like this and then flipping it up. Like, there's, there's sophistication that needs to be observed in, in all of that. Yeah. Um, but I do think, you know, when it comes to the arts and sciences, I think he's onto something. I think if we show the video, yep. it's only 10 minutes, it'll yep. crystallize and help pull together a lot of these things. All right, yep. I want to start this second lecture with a thought experiment. I talked in the first lecture about the, the chaos, the flux, the strangeness of this new world in which we find ourselves. 
And precisely because of that chaos and that strangeness, it's, it's difficult to boil down the story to, to a single anecdote or to a single point. But I want to engage in a thought experiment that, that kind of captures the spirit of the age, that, that sort of helps us get to much of what has gone on over the last few hundred years. Imagine going to your doctor maybe a hundred years ago and saying to your doctor, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body. Your doctor would have responded, well, well that's a problem. Uh, that's a problem with your mind and we need to address your mind in order to bring it into line with your body. If you were to go to your doctor today and say the same thing, I'm a woman trapped in a man's body, your doctor would certainly say to you, that's a problem. And he's likely to say to you, that's a problem with your body and we need to bring your body into line with your mind. Now when you compare those two anecdotes, it's very clear that something remarkable has happened between those two events. Something very deep has taken place within our culture. And I would say what has taken place is this, that our feelings, our psychology, how we think, that, that voice inside our heads, if you like, has taken on peculiar authority, such that not even our bodies now are considered powerful enough or authoritative enough to override it. And that's not just the opinion of doctors, of course, but has become the opinion of people in general in society. The question is, how has that taken place? How have our feelings become so authoritative? Well, it's a long story. It doesn't begin in the last 10, 15, 20 years. It really begins hundreds of years ago. I'm going to start the story with a man called Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Rousseau was an 18th century philosopher, and Rousseau's great insight into what it meant to be human was this, that it was society that messes us up. There was society that squeezes us into its mold. And that the real you, the real me, the real person with the inner feelings, uncoerced, untrammeled, unsqueezed into a mold by society. Rousseau was the man who articulated this and said, you know, the way to produce real, authentic people, kind people, empathetic people, is to try to make society conform to our inner feelings or to, to get society out of the way. Rousseau's thinking might be summed up by saying, you are what you feel. It is that inner voice of nature, that cry of nature within you that determines who you are. Now Rousseau was a philosopher and not many people today will have read Rousseau. Maybe some of you have not even heard of him, yet I guarantee you that the world in which you live and the way that you perhaps think, certainly the way I think, has been shaped in, in powerful ways, intuitive ways, by the thought of Rousseau. One of the reasons for this is that Rousseau's thought was popularized by an artistic movement that we now refer to as Romanticism in the late 18th, early 19th century. Maybe you're familiar with some of the poetry of Percy Bysshe Shelley or William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, perhaps the paintings of J.M.W. Turner or Caspar David Friedrich. Perhaps you prefer music. Perhaps you've listened to some of the powerful mu music of Franz Liszt or, or you're a Beethoven fan and you've listened to Beethoven and you've noticed that in his late string quartets, he's starting to sound a little different. One of the things you notice about these artists is they appeal to the emotions. The way they write their poetry, the way they paint their paintings, the way they compose their music is not so much to reflect a, a structure and an order as it is to appeal directly to the heart. And that really comes out of that way of thinking that we find embodied in the world of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, where an important part of who you are is what you feel. An important part of who you are is your psychology. Now, it's a long way from William Wordsworth to Caitlyn Jenner. It's a long way from Romanticism to transgenderism. But what we notice with the Romantic movement is this, that priority on feelings as providing the authentic you is starting to emerge very powerfully in the artistic world of the late 18th and early 19th century. Now, I want you to think about today. Think about that. 
First of all, I think it's important to realize that, that Romanticism, and Rousseau even, is not entirely wrong in this. Think about the Psalms. Think about the amount of emotions that there are in the Psalms. The Bible is very clear that, that human beings are emotional beings. The things that inspire us to action are often love and hate. They're things that we feel as much as things that we think, perhaps things that we feel more so. Think of the story in David and Bathsheba. Think of how his uh, kingdom is, is train wrecked because of his inner passions and his inner feelings. Think of Psalm 88 and the expression of emotion there. The, the psalmist is lamenting there. We might say the psalmist is identified with his feelings and with his lamentation there. And notice the form of the psalms. The psalms are poetry. Why are they poetry? Because poetry appeals to more than just our reason, more than just our brains on sticks, if you like. Poetry appeals to our emotions. So I'd want to say that, that romanticism certainly captures something that's important and true about what it means to be a human being. We're not just brains on sticks. We're feeling creatures. We have an inner space. We are emotional. And those things are important to who we are. Notice the power of art as well. How much of the way we think, even about the world around us today, is shaped not so much by arguments we read, but by stories we know, by movies we watch, by music we listen to. And this is where it gets tricky, I think, for Christians. Think about your approach to, say, sexual morality. Think about your approach to worldly possessions. Think about your approach to what constitutes the good and the beautiful. And then ask yourself, how much of what you believe or think about those issues is rooted in you thinking back to first principles, to you thinking in terms of arguments and reason? And how much of how you think about those things is really shaped by, say, television programs you've watched, or by stories you've heard, or by friendships you've had, by relationships you've experienced? Think about how much of the way you think about morality is perhaps shaped not so much by reason as it is by what we might call gut reaction, by feelings. Think about the language we often use today about morality. We often use language of feeling, don't we? I find that comment offensive. What that person did was hurtful. That was a very distasteful thing to do. When you think about language like that, that's pointing us towards, I would say, that, that kind of romantic sensibility. That human beings, we're, we're constituted by our feelings. We're constituted by our emotions, we're constituted by our passions. And then ask yourself, to what extent is that a legitimate position for a Christian to have? Now don't get me wrong, I certainly want to say that, that feelings are important in the way that Christians operate morally. If I look out of the window and I see something really bad being done to somebody, say I, I see an old lady being attacked in the street, and I don't instinctively feel that is wrong and instinctively feel outrage and instinctively want to help her, then you'd say, well, Truman's a morally defective being in some way. Feelings are very, very important. But then ask yourself, how do we balance feelings with reason? Or perhaps better still, how do we make sure that our feelings are properly attuned to the moral principles that the Bible articulates. Think about some aspect of biblical teaching, moral teaching, that perhaps you know in your head is right, but you find really difficult to apply in your daily life and in your interactions with others. Think about why you might feel that difficulty. Is it because a soap opera or a sitcom has sent an image of, of that thing that you know is a virtue and presented it as a vice? Has it taught you to feel wrongly about that good thing. So to go back to where I started this lecture, that uh, prioritizing that we see in the modern world of, of feelings over what we might say external authority, even the authority of our body, that really starts in the 18th century. The complicated thing is it's, it's not an entirely bad thing. But knowing, knowing that story, 
knowing how feelings have come to dominate how we think and bringing them to bear against biblical teaching that's going to be part of the key for us to think correctly and morally about the world in which we now find ourselves as we move forward. About time to go. Does anybody have a question before we head out? Yes, Mary Beth. How close do you think the correlation between philosophy and theology is? I'm going to punt that to Dr. Bennett. <laughs> How do you co a correlation do you think is there for philosophy? Just in general or on this issue? On this issue, or in general. Oh, I mean, I think in Western thinking, philosophy and theology has always been intertwined mm -hmm. and interconnected. Yeah. Um, you know, Rousseau is reading Augustine, yeah. you know, so he's, he's a layer of original sin, he just rejects it. Mm -hmm. um, so they're, they're tightly woven throughout history. Who is Rousseau's greatest uh, critic? You know, probably after him. Yes. Probably Emmanuel Kant. So do you think that it was the artists, the, the painters that influenced the, the writers, or the writers that influenced the painters more? Like how? I think it's a little bit of both. So uh, Rousseau's Confessions was 1781. Sounds about right. 1781, and Lyrical Ballads wasn't until 1789. Um, and the storming of the Bastille is around the same time too, and so it's kind of a, um, kind of like a social imaginary example of these ideas actually being put into practice. Um, Confessions by Rousseau is kind of the first autobiography that focuses on self-expression because Augustine, of course, wrote Confessions, but it was pointed to the higher truth. But that's not what Rousseau was doing. Rousseau was speaking solely about himself and his perceptions of the world. And so I think they were influencing each other. Um, and without confessions, perhaps Wordsworth and Coleridge and Shelley wouldn't have been so eager. But I think it's, it's very much also they're both reacting to the Enlightenment. Um, so what would it have been without the Enlightenment? I don't know if we would have had quite the Rousseau, Rousseau that we had. Or the or the artists. So I mean, you, I, I think the what is it? The catalyst for this thought is the structure of society then was so more shackling to the individual self, of, you know, top-down authority from mm -hmm. kings and queens, and yeah. I think that's the initial reaction is that yeah, there is some truth to that, and there should be some self-expression independent of society. And then when you say two hundred years later, it's come off the rails a little bit. So yeah, yeah. there is truth there. It's just What's the dose of truth you want to take from it? And the romantics helped that shift from like the idealization of, of topics, like what was okay to treat seriously as a topic for literary works and artistic works. The romantic era brought everyone into being a topic that was worthy of dignity and exploration. And so that kind of taking from that idealized idea to a mundane um, and, and elevating the mundane and common was an important he, he piece of it too. Third Symphony, like he was like heroic. I mean, he wrote a dedication, and I think he wrote it to Napoleon because he thought he was the usher of the breaking of that shackle, and then eventually had to rewrite that dedication. Or, but that's always interesting. Is like when you talk about Beethoven as an example of his transition, I think in the Third Symphony, it's, it's really interesting that that was to whom and that idea that he dedicated that symphony to, and then eventually had to mm -hmm. rescind it. But yeah, you see it in music like yep. that really and even with Romantic Era, there's three separate pieces to the Romantic Era. And you know, even if you follow lists, like his later work is very different from his early work. The, the, if you the film, look at the paintings, a lot of the paintings from that era, the, there are these idealistic landscapes. Like they're the mm -hmm. most beautiful like, yeah. nature that you could imagine. Like this dramatic lighting coming from the clouds on the ship, like I think Turner painted ships mm -hmm. on the ocean and you know. It's, yeah. It, it just makes sense. It'd be interesting to do a study of the painters, like in parallel and see the way. Mimesis is is mimicry, and it was a big part of how artists thought about their work. Um, but what the Romantics added is that they are interested in mimicking, but they're really focused on their perception and the beauty that they saw in it. 
So, yeah, thanks, Todd. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>